Because now I can't see it. <laughs> what about now? Yes. 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 Can you see my go to webinar control panel also? No. No. Okay, no. I'm, I'm doing this blind. Okay, do you see the <laughs> panelist page now? Yes. 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 Okay, well. I'm still kind of blind here because this isn't the view I normally have. So we're going to go with it, though, if everybody can see it. If somebody is having issues seeing my screen that's an attendee, please let me know in the chat window, and we'll try to get that addressed. Sorry for the hiccup. Now you can see everybody's beautiful faces here on the panelist screen. <laughs> this gives you a face to a name and allows you to get a little bit of background information about each person on the panel. Christina, Bill, and I all work here at Pitsco, and um, we have launched some makerspace packages. And so we will speak to specific questions about Pitsco makerspace packages and Pitsco products used in a makerspace. But then we have Cheryl, Lily, and Jessica, who are experts in the, in the field and have firsthand knowledge and firsthand experience with, with makerspaces. Just a brief, brief history, and this is really just to have you take a look at it and we'll move forward. But we did a little bit of digging into what caused this movement, what caused this maker movement. And then there are several things throughout the, the years that have kind of triggered important points in education and important points in, in hands-on learning. And so these just kind of highlight some of those. And this is something that we can provide as a resource after the webinar if anybody's interested in that. So first up, we're going to jump right into question one. Why should an elementary school create a makerspace? And I believe Cheryl's going to take the lead on this one to get us started. Yes, and I hope other people jump in as well. But. Um... After teaching in the elementary level and middle school level, I think a uh, makerspace in an elementary setting just adds to a depth of learning and understanding as it's, it can be integrated into any subject across the curriculum. And it, it also encourages that mindset of a maker where anything is possible for kids. And, and I think if kids are just, if they have to do it outside of school, not everyone will be exposed and even know they could be successful or be drawn to that. I think it, it might, not everyone realizes that they could be a maker. And so if we have that in elementary school settings, then more kids will be empowered by that experience. Um, I mean, I could talk forever on this, but I wanted to give other people a, a time to, to do it as well. Lily or Jessica, do you have any input as to why an elementary school should create a makerspace? Um, I think that elementary schools need to create makerspaces. It helps foster that creativity, um, allows for innovation in elementary school students. Um, helps them to kind of follow those geniuses and cultivate the creativity that they that they have that sometimes is lost um, in the classroom setting. And so makerspaces are great, you know, for that those like passion projects for students. So I think that makerspaces are are definitely something that every elementary school should have in some capacity. I think also that makerspaces um, sort of um, builds that the 21st century skills and it really lends itself well to higher order thinking and just critical thinking and problem solving and so much so many of our um, careers kind of really we have a deficit of that and just really need um, tools to provide rigorous and um, creative and engaging opportunities for our, our students to uh, 
problem solve, invent, innovate, and feel um, empowered and uh, confident in taking risks. And so I think it so much so much of makerspace has been middle school and, and high school. I feel like that elementary that's where really the creativity we need to keep that from being stifled at the elementary level. I really like those other answers as well and I think it's important to remember in an elementary school it can look a makerspace can be a table in a classroom with all kinds of supplies and kids you know having um, that license to innovate um, or it can be a separate spot in your school but there's lots of levels and and that's great I think it can fit a lot of different environments. And Cheryl, um, Cheryl provided us a couple of photos that I'm going to share with everyone. And if you want to, Cheryl, do you want to give a kind of a overview of what's happening here? You bet. So this photo was, this is a sixth grade self-contained class that I went in and worked with. And um, these kids are kind of at that border of being you know, too cool, but there wasn't one kid that wasn't really engaged. So they made robots with just um, an offset motor, batteries, and a lot of embellishments. And then this is the culminating um, robot dance. And then we put on that music, everybody dance now. And they were having a great time. Things were falling off as different robots wiggled and jiggled and, and kids were making adjustments to make them travel more or make them wiggle more or connect a loose circuit. So there was a lot of learning as well as fun. All right, and then this was another photo that you provided as an example of a project done in a makerspace. Yes, and this was, this little guy is a, a fourth grader and he, we had done the bottle racers, which is a Pitsco um, activity kit, but of course they don't have the air launcher at home. And so after that project was done, then I let them um, add some propulsion systems so that their bottle racer would work at home. And so he has a couple of motors with propellers cut out of plastic cups. And this, when we put it on a string, it would actually move, you know, around in a circular way. So it didn't quite fly on its own, but it, he was really proud of it. All right, well, we're gonna have to move forward. We have several questions to cover. The next question is, what type of space is required to create a makerspace? And Jessica, I'll let you take the lead on this one. All right, I think uh, Cheryl kind of hit the nail on the head earlier um, when she was talking about you know, you can have a makerspace by just simply having a table in your room with some supplies on it. Um, a makerspace can be really any size, uh, and you know, I think one of the the one of our key points with a makerspace is that we want it to be a flexible space, a space where we can rearrange it to um, fit the needs of what we're doing at the time. It's a space that has creation materials. Um, collaborative areas where students can get together and communicate and um, talk to each other. It uh, really the design, you know, I feel like there's, it's not a one size fits all. The design needs to be based on the needs and the culture and really the vision of your school, your staff, your students, your community, um, and a place where you spend less time managing students and more time empowering students. Um, you know, we asked community members to give input. We created a creative council of students to give input on what the space uh, should look like. And so, really, um, spaces can look very different. The picture that I think you all are seeing, this is a picture of um, our learning commons, this is our makerspace, and so these are tables that we can roll apart and uh, configure in different ways. We have tools and lots of materials uh, that students can create with, so. Does everyone see, I just wanna make sure everyone, 
the panelist, I think your view looks the same as the attendees. Can you see this screen okay? Because I, my, my computer's messed up right now. I just want to make sure everyone sees the screen I think they see. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. So as Jessica mentioned, the tables that roll apart, it looks like in this photo they're all connected, but then they can they can roll apart. Is that right, Jessica? Yeah, yes. And that's the that's the nice thing about the flexible you know, everything being on wheels is nice, so it can, the students can really kind of make it their own. You know, you want them to own the space, and so they configure it depending on their needs. And here's another um, another shot as well. Is this the same room? Uh, yeah, so this is just kind of looking on the other side of those tables. This is a picture of our entire Learning Commons um, we have a learning commons, and inside our learning commons, we have a makerspace area. And so you can see students doing some reverse engineering in the makerspace. They're taking apart keyboards, and then we will use those materials to create other things. And then there's just other, we have what we call learning stations throughout. Um, and so just that's just a picture of it. Ooh. Okay, and then the next question is also kind of related to the space. What type of equipment should be included in a makerspace? Um, you know, it can be anything from low tech to no tech. I know a lot of times people get caught up on needing the newest gadget or, you know, they hear about something that's out there that everybody's tweeting about. And, you know, really you can start with things that are reusable items, recyclable materials. We ask our students and staff, we have a bunch of lockers, and we ask them, they're all labeled, and we ask them to bring in different recyclable materials like cardboard and paper plates and <coughs> paper towels, uh, things like that. And so we just have storage lockers that they can put those things in. Um, other equipment that we put in there, we look for whenever we, like, for example, when we buy materials from Pitsco, we look for kits that can be used in multiple ways, um, things where it's not going to be a one and done, um, something that we can use and use several times because we have students who are going through, we have, a, we have an elementary school of over 700, um, so we want everybody to be able to use those materials. Um, we're always looking for things like Legos and Kinects and Kiva planks, um, things that can be used multiple ways. All right, does anyone else have anything to add to this question? Well, I just think that um, one of the most successful pieces of equipment that, um, as far as a tool, is also an electronic um, cutter machine. Not, I guess it can cut vinyl. Um, mostly, it just cuts cardstock, but they're they're cheap. And um, if you have several, that really helps kids who have motor difficulties and just the time of it. And the design is rigorous, which you want. And so, I think that's a really great piece of equipment. But I agree, it can be very low tech. And 3D printers, they take they take a long time to print, and so depending on your setup, um, that can be a bottleneck. So I like the idea of stations and um, the materials spread out like we saw in the photos. Very good. Next question. Next question is, what consideration should be made for storage? And I have this question assigned to Christina. Christina has been working on our Pitsco makerspace packages, and there are a lot of hands-on materials that come with those packages. Therefore, it's required some careful thought and experimentation on storage. So I'll let you take this one, Christina. Okay. Um, I think the, the main thing to think about is what space you're using for your makerspace. I know in chats with Lily and um, Jessica, we talked about how um, they don't necessarily have a lot of storage in the space because it's also in the library and the shelves are used for books. So we thought about um, putting things into bins and making sure that everything's in there that you would need for the activity. So with our makerspace packages, we're offering um, 
different color bins where like if you're getting kazoon kites everything you need for kazoon kites can be found in that bin and you can just pick it up and go with it and then that really allows for it to be used at different stations um, or in different setups but if you have an established maker space then obviously your storage is going to look a little bit different as you might have built out all of the time so it's really going to depend on what your space looks like and what um, how I guess you want the students to access the materials, but we are going to offer storage in our packages later this year. Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add for storage in microspaces? Uh, I think it's important to have storage for built projects as well. Uh, once they get done with the project, unless they're going to take it home, you need to have some place to uh, store that at least for a little while to show it off or, uh, or whatever. So. And I think and I remember projects. Jessica did, and Lily, I think oh. I remember having a discussion with you about um, displaying your students' creations in the learning commons. Is there something you do specifically to allow them to showcase what they've done? Um, we have shelves on the walls that we like to display our student work and um, also on the just counters. I think we tried to utilize as much of the uh, open shelves on top of the books, where, uh, on top where the bookshelves are, to help display. And we do a lot of rotating in and out. So as students, new projects come about, we kind of move it in. It creates this uh, sense of ownership for the kids. Um, and one of the ideas of, of just being having the storage is the compactness of the materials and the ease for the students to be able to access all of the materials. So if they're stacked on top of each other and you have to lift four different boxes, then it's not as conducive for the, the kids to really take um, take it take ownership of it. All right. The next question: What can be done to engage risk-averse colleagues in the space? Um, so for our teachers, when we first uh, developed the Learning Commons and the Makerspace area, um, one of the challenges is to sort of get the buy-in from the teachers. And so uh, there was some apprehension from the teachers in using it. So we created a tech shop so that the teachers could come in, we give them sort of a, a hands-on snippet of what the items were, and then they had sort of a, a time for like a med makerspace petting zoo where they could go in and try out the different uh, materials and the different um, supplies that we had or the challenges that we offered in those stations. Um, we also have a, a think tank in our Makerspace, so that's a little spot where we created some question stems. One of the things that the teachers kind of feedback from the teachers was that they weren't sure how it was useful or how they could engage the kids. And so uh, we created just um, a place where they could pick up a cube, and there would be sort of some some um, question stems that they could roll through with the kids and find out having them have the kids think of. Um, deeper um, changes to their original uh, ideas as they're creating different things. So um, what would you change about it? What was your biggest challenge? Different stems for the teachers to ask the kids. And then I think um, the more they used them, the more they saw the value of having that creative maker space and um, being more uh, interactive with the problem solving piece. Um, we also tried to look at some of the activities in the Learning Commons and in the Makerspace and, and have sort of just a short um, snippet of a tech that might align with that activity. So the Kiva Planks, we picked out some Force in Motion, um, uh, teats for a grade level, and that way the teachers felt like they were more um, content driven or could add to that. So once they kind of saw that, that a lot of the activities could be tech aligned, they kind of took it, um, ownership of it and, and started thinking themselves of different ways that 
they could use the activities to build background knowledge or to solidify the concept of the tech. Thank you, Lily. And we have, Lily was um, kind enough to provide those questions that are on the cubes in a handout. So in the handout section, I've uploaded those. So those will be available. And then I'll also provide those with, in the follow-up email as well, in case you don't get those here. So there's, um, it's a PDF of the, the kind of deeper questioning that you can see on the cubes here in the think tank. And those will be provided. One th another thing that I do to help um, teachers feel more comfortable in, and also helping them connect the learning is I actually go in the classroom and we'll do an activity together and something that relates to something they need to be teaching. Um, and then they kind of see the level of engagement. We pick something with a pretty easy access on-ramp for them and um, the contagious is really, uh, the enthusiasm is so contagious that they're drawn in as you know when they see their students um, engaged and learning and and see the power of that kind of experience so um, I work in a lot of different classes with teachers one or two times and and then they're off they're taken off themselves all right very good. All right, next question. What themes will go well in a makerspace? And Jessica, I have this um, Learning Commons idea slide here for yes. you, too. So, so when we were planning, we just started uh, talking to our kids and kind of getting some ideas from them about what they would like to see in the makerspace. Um, and that kind of helped us as we started thinking of, like I said, we have more of a kind of learning stations. Um, and so themes kind of kind of organically happen from that. This is just kind of some of our ideas as they were going. Um, so when we talk about themes, um, we did, so we have a robotic petting zoo. Um, and so, you know, we have the, the newest robots. Um, so that way kids can come in and they can they can code and they can do those. We have audio video, so with the video, we have video production um, with green screen. We have the stop motion animation. Uh, we have a lot of stuff, you know, our music teacher uses um, with GarageBand. Um, we have a 3D printing, but like Cheryl said, you know, there are uh, limitations to that. We have coding areas. Uh, circuitry is a big one. Um, just building areas with just different types of materials, uh, reverse engineering, and um, cardboard creation. Those are kind of the standard themes that we have. And then other, other kind of stations, we call them more of flexible stations. They're kind of rotated in and out depending on um, what we're working on at the time. Um, so that's kind of our, our big umbrella of themes that we have in our makerspace. Awesome, thank you. And the next slide that I'm going to show, I'll let. Whoops, I skipped over. I'll let I'll let Bill take the lead on this slide. Yeah, this is a a little bit different um, thought process and organization. Uh, no rights or wrongs to uh, to any of the organizations. It's just how you're thinking about it and. Um, and what your where your school situation is, but you could go into things like uh, structures and sustainable energy, aerospace, 3D printing, robotics, um, and those would be a, a good way to uh, to structure that. You might do uh, do one on medieval engineering, um, especially if you have a liter literacy or a social science um, teacher is, who is doing uh, some work with medieval times. Uh, you could do catapults and trebuchets uh, and other other uh, wartime machinery like that, medieval machinery. So in any case, lots of different ways that um, that these could be ganged together to uh, to create a theme. And convenient that in our Pitsco Big Book, these sections 
are are titled this yeah. exact this exact Absolutely. one. So that can help in, in finding what you're looking for. Next up, how do you fund a makerspace? And this is a question that we we get a lot. So I want to make sure we have some time to, to cover this one. And I think Lily's going to take the lead on it. Um, yeah, so when we started uh, working on our learning commons and makerspace, um, definitely funding is a challenge. We are a Title I bilingual campus. And so with over 700 students, like Jessica mentioned, and so we um, really tried to look um, for great uh, ways to fund a lot of the teachers you know are so dedicated and they spend a lot of their own money on uh, materials but we have written grants to uh, the education our education foundation so every school district a lot of them have education foundations that offer grants um, so uh, several of the teachers wrote different grants um, for different aspects of our Makerspace. Um, we also um, utilize Donors Choose. It's a great um, resource to uh, find funding. So we would write some grants to Donors Choose, and a lot of times they would have uh, matching grants from companies and organizations who are particularly interested in promoting um, STEM uh, fields. And so um, we found that to be really helpful. We looked at private organizations and um, uh, particularly your engineering, uh, computer science. We reached out to our universities. They offered a coding class to our elementary students uh, over a period of six to eight weeks. Um, also community and parents. We just kind of put the word out and a lot a lot of parents who had connections were able to, and they were excited about our, our uh, space, were able to kind of donate or connect us with um, groups and organizations. Um, we also thought because of make, our makerspace has a lot of sort of recyclable and reusable items or um, things that we create with from everyday materials, we uh, put out a giving tree right in our front area. And so we just made these leaves and we would put just things that we needed that need replenishing. So things like straws or um, those skewers or paper clips or um, just different materials that the students, consumables that the students use during uh, a lot of their challenges or their creations. Uh, the parents are so excited to be able to just help out in that way and a, a lot of we try to keep a lot of our materials in the ten to fifteen dollar range where they could if they were at the store they could just pick up a pack of batteries or something and then uh, bring it back with their little leaf and donate it to our our uh, maker space all right and then re thank you Lily this is a great idea um, can everyone see I hope everyone can see the, the giving tree example that Lily provided the next question is also related to funding. What is the recommendation if there is little snow funding? And Lily touched on this um, a little bit, but I'm going to hit Cheryl up for some additional input for this question. Well, my family I hated it when we'd go into stores. They'd go the other way because they worried I was going to ask for something. Um, but, you know, you can ask local businesses for a donation or um, I love the giving tree idea because it's so doable, small little things. But we would put articles in our newsletter of things that we were short on and parents would, actually people would come out of the woodwork. The other, you know, grants sometimes take um, lead time and approval through your district and then, you know, you're ready to do it tomorrow and so you have to wait for grant funding if you're lucky enough to secure it. So we would always hit up organizations like all those animal groups in town, like the lions and the eagles and the elks. And um, we would get, you know, um, sometimes a few hundred dollars from each of them. Or um, the American Legion um, was great and very generous. And they had like auxiliary organizations and, or the VFW, 
people go there and spend a lot of money on alcohol and they're looking for good places to put their money. So I think those are great ideas along with special designated fundraisers like a spaghetti feed, even though everybody gets so tired of those um, fundraisers. Um, but sometimes when it's for something specific that everyone is really behind, it goes over well. Very good. We just have a couple more questions. We're a little bit behind, but we'll we'll get through these last couple slides quickly. This last question is specific to Pitsco makerspace packages. And there is a URL link, pitsco.com slash makerspace, if you're interested in learning more about those packages. But I'll let Bill speak to those specifically for just a minute. Well, if I had my mic on, I could speak to it. Um, we've developed uh, different makerspace packages at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Um, we have also materials packages, which provides a, um, a wealth of just different items and uh, components that kids can tinker with. And then we have a tools package, which provides a lot of the uh, different tools that are needed for um, kids to make things. So you can take a look at those different packages. And if you have questions, please let us know. All right, and then this is um, one of our last slides is a resource that Jessica had provided. And I thought it was um, really cool. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to copy this and put it in the chat window, only because I'm having computer issues. And I, since it's working now, I don't want to mess it up. So I'll make sure to provide everyone this link so you can click it and go there and check out this Padlet. And basically, it's just um, a page that has a lot of different ideas and a lot of ways that answer this question, what do great maker spaces have in common? And it's just kind of a collection of ideas. And Jessica, if you want to explain that a little bit more, you can as well. But I'll provide this link in the chat window. Yeah, it, it's just a, a Padlet where people, um, I, I got it on Twitter, I think uh, Laura Fleming shared it, and uh, just her PLN and whoever was on there uh, just kind of added, you know, ideas about what great makerspaces have. So there's some, there's some really good stuff there. And then this last resource is um, the Stages of Making. And I'll let you take this one too, Jessica, if you'd like. Um, well, you know, we talk to our teachers a lot about sometimes you can't just put some cardboard in front of kids and, and expect them to create a masterpiece. You know, there are different stages of making. Um, so sometimes you need to show them some examples and, and have them work up that continuum of making. So I really like this too. And again, this Stages of Making resource is available in the handout section. So you should have a section that's right above your chat section that says handouts. And this graphic is there for you as well. So we're going to open it up. We're a little over time, but we'll devote a couple minutes to some open Q&A. And there, was a few, there were a few questions that came through. One was, can you define makerspace? What makes a makerspace? I know that there's some conflicting definitions possibly. So this question is specific about what the definition of a makerspace is and the difference between a makerspace and a STEM lab. Mm -hmm. I, uh, well, to me, um, if you wanna know the difference between a makerspace and a STEM lab, I think, um, STEM labs a lot of times have more curriculum connections. Uh, makerspaces a lot of times are more open-ended, letting kids kind of explore and tinker and imagine and create. Um, as far as a definition of makerspace, I, I think that's a really hard one because makerspaces are different to pretty much everybody. Um, so I don't know if I, I really have a, a true makerspace definition. I, this is Cheryl, and I think another um, distinguishing feature is the idea that, and this might not be exactly how it could be done in a school, but the idea that 
people could come and go, kids could come and go and work on it different times. There'd be this open exchange of ideas, collaboration, you know, some serendipitous um, ideas that are generated because of that, and definitely student-centered, um, where a STEM lab, I think, is more, um, it's going to have some definite um, directions that kids need to follow. Um, but I think there could still be a lot of open-ended engineering and tinkering in that as well. But um, definitely related, maybe that distinction helps. Okay, another question that's come through is, what kinds of stations do you have in your learning commons? And is it in the media center or is it a separate space? Um, our learning commons was our library. So we transformed our library into a learning commons, um, but it still has all of the books. We just kind of re we revamped and moved furniture and redesigned it. Um, the stations are kind of what uh, the what I talked about whenever we talked about the themes um, with the coding and the robotic petting zoo. We have a separate room that is our audio visual, so that's where our green screen is. That's where um, all of the, the video making things are. The 3D printing, we have coding, circuitry, uh, cardboard creation, which uh, we have, you know, one, one of our stations is our makerspace. So I know some places just have a makerspace. We have a makerspace as a station. Um, so those are those are kind of some of our our stations, and like I said, um, we also have flexible stations that rotate in and out, and those change depending on the needs of or kind of, or what the curriculum is at the time. Okay, and then this question is directed at you, Jessica. If you had to do one thing over again, what would you do differently within the Learning Commons? Um, I that's a. That one's kind of tough. Um, the way that we did it was we got input and then we we created the space. I think if I had to do something different, um, I would have started a little more slowly and really made sure that we had teacher buy-in um, because it's a it's a lot for teachers. Um, it can be overwhelming because there are so many things uh, that that teachers are uncomfortable with. Um, so probably. Just making sure we, we kind of slowed down the process a little bit more. Okay. And then also relating to the makerspace in an elementary setting, since it is such a set schedule and there's no free time for kids in the elementary setting, when do students come? So uh, we did configure uh, some of our library time when the students used to come once a week to the library and had a set session. We kind of used some of that time. Um, the students are able to come during the part of the day if the teacher uh, is looking at their schedule, either in their integrated, we have an integrated curriculum, so science and uh, social studies are integrated in health. And so um, if there is a topic that they could utilize the space for, uh, a lot of the teachers will, will choose to go to the learning commons um, because it either reinforces the concept that they're trying to teach or they're able to use the materials in there to introduce the concept. Um, we also have an after school uh, girls engineering club and so uh, we meet in there and they're able to, you know, just different populations are able to go in and, and utilize the space. All right. I think that wraps it up. We've gotten through all of our questions. We're just a little bit over time, but I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank you to all the panelists for your contributions. We will get this recording um, published and it'll be sent out via email in a follow up.